Welcome circles to Anchor by Truth, truth brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. By Cecil D. DeMille's In John 14.6, Jesus said, Moses. I am the way, what time period the is truth, the view for the light and the life. Our goal is to encourage everyone to grow in the Christian faith by anchoring themselves to the secure truth found in the inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of God. The Lord possessed me with wisdom at the beginning of His work, the first of His acts of old. Ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. Proverbs chapter 8, verses 22 and 23 English Standard Version. Greetings! Welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. I'm Victoria Kay. This is our ninth episode in a series that we are doing on archaeology and the Bible. We're nine episodes into the brief overview of just a few of the thousands of archaeologic discoveries that support the accuracy of the Bible's text. So often today, we hear critics attempt to label the Bible as a book that has little connection to the real world. But when reviewed objectively, it is obvious that the Bible is a book that is firmly set in time and place. And as a book set in time and place, it is demonstrable that the human history that the Bible chooses to report is accurate. And archaeology is very supportive of the Bible's historical trustworthiness. That's why we wanted to do this series. To help us continue to explore this topic, in the studio today we have R.D. Fierro. R.D. is an author and the founder of Crystal Sea Books. R.D., today you said you wanted to begin to wrap up the series. So, what do you want listeners to begin to think about as we think about the series as a whole? Well, before we get into the meat of today's episode, I'd also like to greet everyone and just welcome them to Anchored by Truth. We're glad you're here. We hope that these episodes bless you, and we certainly hope that you spend some time every day reading the Bible, because we know the one thing that will bring blessing to everybody's lives is spending time with the Word of God. Well, as we've stressed throughout this series, archaeology is a study of the past, and the vast majority of sites that are of archaeological interest pertain to times and dates that occurred long before anyone who's now living was alive. So that means that anyone who's attempting to glean information about the past from archaeological finds, artifacts, and sites, they're always looking at evidence that is available in the present, but they have to interpret what that evidence means. And that's going to be true whether the person making the interpretation is a Christian or a non-Christian. It also means that it is quite reasonable and it's likely that there are going to be occasions when similarly qualified experts will disagree on the interpretation of a particular find. In other words, we are simply never going to be able to obtain the same degree of certainty about past events from archaeological science that we're going to be able to get from branches of operational science. Because in operational science, people can replicate the results of other people's work. But you can't do that with the past. Now, this certainly does not mean that rigor and discipline aren't possible and essential in archaeology. They certainly are. And it certainly doesn't mean that we can't rule out some possible explanations based on the application of evidence and reason to what we find. So you can do archaeology. Certainly, people do do archaeology with rigor and discipline, applying logic and reason. But it does mean that alternative explanations are possible in many situations as people think about what a particular find or artifact might mean. And therefore, people today have to be prepared to sort among these potentially competing explanations for what a particular archaeological find may mean. What you're saying is that as Christians, we must always be aware that no matter how convincing a biblical explanation may be for a find or artifact or site, that we must be aware that other explanations for that same evidence are possible. And we must be prepared to deal with those alternative non-biblical explanations because the world is going to consider those explanations. Because if we can't intelligently discuss why the Christian explanation is at least as reasonable as the non-Christian alternative, we will be far less effective in our witness for Christ in the public arena. In other words, we have to know what the other side believes 
and we must be prepared to engage their arguments kindly, compassionately, insensibly, but firmly. Right. The old saying is that there are two sides to every story. And while that saying has some truth, that does not mean that each side of the story is equally credible or reasonable. So one of the things that we kind of need to talk about as we wrap up our series is to think about a couple of examples where there are competing explanations for archaeological sites that are part of the biblical record. Where do you want to start? Well, we spent the last couple of episodes of Anchored by Truth talking about the city of Jericho, especially about God's miraculous intervention and the Hebrews' conquest of it. So let's go back and think a little bit more about the city of Jericho. And just remind everybody that the miraculous intervention of God occurred just as the Hebrews were ending their wilderness wanderings. After they had been rescued from captivity in Egypt, they spent 40 years wandering in the desert. And so, of course, they encountered Jericho as they were ending that period of wilderness wandering. This is the well-known story found in the book of Joshua, chapter 6. The Hebrews encountered Jericho just after crossing the Jordan River into the Promised Land. Militarily, the Hebrews needed to conquer Jericho, but it was a walled and heavily fortified town, and the Hebrews did not have the kind of siege equipment necessary to breach those kinds of walls, at least not quickly. But fortunately, they didn't have to. As God directed, they marched around the walls once a day for six days. Then, on the seventh day, they marched around the walls seven times, shouted, and the walls fell down. And, while we won't go over the evidence that supports that account again, because we covered it in our two previous episodes, we will note that there is substantial archaeologic evidence that supports the biblical account. Yes, and there is an abundance of archaeological evidence that Jericho was located exactly where the Bible says that it is, that Jericho at one time had very large and imposing walls, and that, in fact, those large and imposing walls did, in fact, fall down flat, as the English Standard Version puts it. Now, several excavators at Jericho have determined that the walls collapsing absolutely down flat was likely due to an earthquake. And so, even though that fact is well known, that the walls did, in fact, collapse down flat, as the Bible says, there is a question that is hotly debated, and that is when the walls fell down. And so there are various dating options for when the exodus occurred, and therefore when the city of Jericho fell to Joshua, and hence when the walls would have fallen down flat because of God's miraculous intervention. Now, we don't have time to go into all the options that are thrown about for the dating of the exodus and the conquest of Jericho, but there are two options that are most frequently talked about. There's the so-called late date for the exodus, and then there's the early date for the exodus. So the most commonly accepted date for the Exodus in scholarly circles is the late date. That's the dating theory that was used in Cecil B. DeMille's famous movie, The Ten Commandments, starring Charlton Heston as Moses. What time period is in view for the late date? Around 1290 B.C., and that would be referred to as early in the 13th century B.C. And what time period is in view for the early date? Around 1445 or 1446 B.C., which would have been over a hundred years earlier. Now, that's the date that we arrive at by calculating the time periods that are referred to in the Bible in verses such as 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. The version in the English Standard Version reads, quote, In the 480th year after the people of Israel came out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the second month, Solomon began to build the house of the Lord, unquote. Yes. So we know that Solomon's reign as the king of Israel began in 970 B.C. That would mean the fourth year of Solomon's reign was 966 B.C. So that means that 480 years earlier would have been 1446 B.C., But we have to remember that the Hebrew calendar that they used in those days is not the same as the Gregorian calendar that we use today. They didn't have a January to December year. Also in the Bible, some numbers may have been rounded off. 
So allowing for those factors, Orthodox conservative Christian scholars have usually placed the date for the start of the Exodus between 1447 B.C. and 1442 B.C. So it's commonplace to refer to Joshua's conquest of Jericho as taking place late in the 15th century B.C. The 15th century B.C. began in the year 1500 B.C. and ended in the year 1401 B.C. Right. So, while there is agreement on the fact that at some time in the distant past, the walls of Jericho did collapse as the Bible describes, there is a very clear division of opinion on exactly when the walls fell down. So, a Bible critic may acknowledge that there is archaeologic evidence that is consistent with major portions of chapter 6 of the book of Joshua, but then immediately turn around and say that the Bible still isn't trustworthy because it got dates wrong. And as we started out saying, all any present-day investigator can do is look at the available evidence and then interpret what that says about things like ancient dates. It's not as though anybody 3,300 or 3,400 years ago chiseled dates into the sides of buildings to make it easier to assign precise dates. No, they didn't. But that doesn't mean that we don't have some tools that can help us resolve our dating dilemma. And while we don't have time to discuss all the ways that dating is accomplished for archaeological sites, let's just go over a couple as examples. First, we can look to see what information can be gleaned from artifacts that are found at a site. You know, often, even if there aren't written records that are found at a site, there are other things that will contain helpful references. Things like jewelry or coins or decorative items. These kind of items can provide clues as to when that item was being used. And this is particularly true with pottery pieces or pottery shards, even small pieces of pottery. Because you know it's been common throughout human history to decorate items, even ones that are used for practical purposes like jars or lamps. And just as today, decorative styles in the ancient world came and went. And since pottery is a lot more durable than anything made out of cloth or paper, pottery is often present at ancient sites even when hundreds or thousands of years have passed. So we can find the pottery fragments or shards at a site, and we can use them often to help us date when that site was active with people. Now, in the case of excavations at the city of Jericho, Over 100,000 pottery fragments have been unearthed. So what do the pottery fragments found at Jericho tell us? Well, frankly, the pottery fragments favor the early date theory, the 1446-1445 date for the Exodus. And that's because there are almost no pottery fragments found at Jericho that are what would be labeled Mycenaean. You know, we've talked about in other episodes of Anchored by Truth that Mycenae is just another name for the region that we think of as Greece. And the Mycenaeans were a seafaring people. They traveled widely, including to most of the coasts of the Mediterranean Sea. And that included the eastern coast of the Mediterranean, where Israel is. So as a consequence, Mycenaean pottery is found all over the Mediterranean coastal lands. Well, Mycenaean pottery began to appear in Palestine from about 1400 B.C. onward. And therefore, if the conquest of Jericho had been around 1290 B.C., as the late date theory suggests, then there should have been plenty of Mycenaean pottery fragments present in Jericho. But there aren't. The early date theory explains this absence very easily. The Hebrews conquered Jericho before Mycenaean pottery became commonplace in Palestine. By 1290 BC, Mycenaean pottery would have been circulating in Palestine for over a hundred years, but around the first part of the 15th century BC, around 1500 BC, 1495 BC, around that time, there would have been very little Mycenaean pottery in circulation. So, The absence of Mycenaean pottery at Jericho, that's very hard to reconcile with the late date theory. How about the other artifacts found at Jericho? What do they tell us about whether the late date theory or the early date theory is most likely to be correct? Well, and there are other archaeological findings that point strongly to the early date theory being correct. For instance, Palestine in the 15th century BC was strongly connected to Egypt. Because you got to remember, at this time, Egypt was the dominant power in that region. 
the Egyptians had mines and a lot of other economic interests in Palestine. Trade between the two regions was extensive, so one common item that circulated in those days was scarabs. According to the Wikipedia entry, quote, Scarabs are beetle-shaped amulets and impression seals which were widely popular throughout ancient Egypt. They still survive in large numbers today. Through their inscriptions and topology, they prove to be an important source of information for archaeologists and historians of the ancient world and represent a significant body of ancient Egyptian art, unquote. In other words, scarabs were like modern jewelry pieces. They were valuable, and therefore, they were not thrown away or destroyed. They are frequently found in graves with their owners. Like some modern jewelry items, they often contain images of royalty. Think about the things like commemorative lockets made for the various milestone of Queen Elizabeth's long reign. So, as the Wikipedia quote states, by looking at the images contained on the scarabs, we can get an idea about when they were produced and in circulation. What do the scarabs found at Jericho tell us? Well, one of the best-known archaeologists who did extensive excavations at Jericho is John Garstang. And after years of Garstang excavating a cemetery at Jericho, he found that there wasn't any scarabs that could be dated later than the reign of Pharaoh Amenhotep III, and Pharaoh Amenhotep III reigned from 1412 B.C. to 1376 B.C. We probably should remind our listeners that in the time before the birth of Jesus, the years are frequently labeled B.C., which simply means before Christ. Since these early designations get smaller as you approach the birth of Christ, the larger numbers are actually further back in time. This is the opposite of how we assign annual dates today, where it's the smaller numbers that are older. So, for the years before Christ, 1412 B.C. is older than 1376 B.C. It can be easy to get that confused. And that's a good note. So, Pharaoh Amenhotep III began his reign in 1412 B.C., and his reign lasted for about 36 years. So that's plenty of time in which his cartouche would have been put on decorative items like scarabs. A cartouche is just a common graphic symbol. It's an oval with a line at one end, and it indicates that the name that is found within the oval is a royal name. Right. So the absence of any scarabs with cartouches of any pharaohs later than Amenhotep III means that later pharaohs weren't known or weren't represented at that site. Well, that would be very strange if the late date theory was correct. The late date theory says that the pharaoh at the time of the Exodus was Ramses II. Well, there were a lot of pharaohs between Amenhotep III and Ramses II. So the fact that there weren't any scarabs or other decorative items that had cartouches of these later pharaohs, that's a strong indicator that the early date theory about the timing of the Exodus is correct. And therefore, the destruction of Jericho by Joshua would have been around 1400 B.C. So, the really big point that we want to make by this discussion is that there may be competing explanations about how to correctly date events from the past. And even though no one living was present then, we can look at the evidence available in the present and make reasoned determinations about which explanation is most likely to be true. And one way to do that is to look at finds and artifacts and see what they tell us about what was going on in the world at that time. Who was in power? What trade was occurring? What building techniques were available and in use? Are there any written records from the period? Information can be gleaned from any sources. And, of course, some people will say that scientific measurements, such as radiocarbon dating, can be helpful. Well, how about radiocarbon dating? Isn't it frequently used to assign dates to ancient sites and artifacts? It is, but there are a lot of problems with radiocarbon dating, and these problems are well known in the scientific community. Radiocarbon dating depends on determining the ratio present today in a particular specimen or artifact between carbon-14, which is radioactive, and carbon-12, which is not, because carbon-14 decays into carbon-12. And we don't have time to go into all the details of how carbon-14 is formed, but here are a couple of the big points associated with radiocarbon dating. Radiocarbon dating can only be used on organic residue, such as wooden artifacts, 
because the radioactive carbon-14 has to be absorbed by a living entity to be present at all. Next, radiocarbon dating depends on certain baseline assumptions, like how much carbon-14 was present at the beginning of that artifact's existence, and those kind of baseline assumptions are simply unprovable. Third, we know that the rate of formation of carbon-14 is affected by the strength of the Earth's magnetic shield. Well, the Earth's magnetic shield has been declining through time. That's well known, well understood, and in fact, that's one of the strong pieces of evidence that the Earth is not millions or billions of years old, because if it were, we probably wouldn't have a magnetic shield at all. The Earth's magnetic shield is declining through time. Well, what this means is that farther back in time we go, especially as we get closer to the flood of Noah, the more adjustments are necessary to compensate for the magnetic field, which would have been stronger in those days. Now, the net result of all of these issues, and I'm just citing a few, is that, as you said, radiocarbon dates are assigned, not measured. We can't measure dates. We can look at the evidence, examine the evidence, make determinations from the evidence, but then the date is assigned. People get the idea that radiocarbon dates can be measured directly. They can't. Now, that's not to say that radiocarbon dating cannot be a useful tool. Radiocarbon dating can be a useful tool for certain things like determining relative dates, but it has severe limitations in assigning absolute dates. In other words, we simply don't possess all the information that would be necessary to precisely calculate a date by measuring the ratio of one substance and compare it to another. We can never be sure what the starting ratio was unless someone had been there had reported it, which is never going to happen with archaeology. We can never be sure about whether assumed formation rates are accurate or whether contamination occurred at some point. Dates assigned by measuring ratios of various elements often differ by tens of thousands or even millions of years. In such cases, the scientists will often dismiss the dates that don't conform to their expectations, but this just amounts to selecting data that reinforces an original hypothesis or bias. Right. Radiocarbon dating can be helpful for certain purposes. But sometimes people cite it as if it settles every dating question that's ever occurred. Well, it doesn't, and it can't, because it rests on unprovable assumptions. Doesn't mean it should be dismissed. It just means we should keep its limitations in mind as we consider what we think it's telling us. And the point that we want to drive home today for our listeners, for Christians, is that Christians must be prepared to hear explanations for archaeological finds that the world will tell us, well, this disproves the Bible. But we need to not accept such claims on face value. Certainly one of the best-known explorers who did excavations at the site of Jericho was an archaeologist named Kathleen Kenyon. And Kenyon disagreed with Garstang's findings, about the correct dating of the ruins at Tel El Sultan, which is normally agreed to be the site of the ancient Jericho. Well, one reason that Kenyon disagreed with Garstang was that she said that the pottery shards that she found in the collapsed wall that was believed that fell when Joshua was there were not from the mid-15th century BC, but from an older period. In ancient times, and even today, when builders are building walls, they will throw scraps of unusable building material as part of the fill. The builder knows the fill won't be seen, so it doesn't matter whether it's broken concrete, metal scraps, or old pieces of pottery. That's a common building practice today, and it was in ancient times. So, we can derive some dating information about when a structure was built if we find scraps that have some identifying information. Someone who tore down a fireplace and found a coin that had fallen into the cement would know that the latest date the fireplace was built. But it seems to mean that Kenyon's conclusion doesn't necessarily follow her observation. There are houses in America that date from the Revolutionary War period that are still standing today, 250 years later than when they were built. If one of those houses fell over today, its walls are still going to be composed of building material from 1776. The fact that the walls fell in the 21st century doesn't change that the fallen material was from 250 years ago. And that's a great observation. 
And what it does is illustrate that we have to think carefully through the conclusions that are drawn from archaeological evidence. The evidence from any particular find site or artifact might be consistent with multiple and sometimes varying conclusions. So if we find that a piece of evidence could be interpreted in multiple ways, then we have to look at other evidence to determine which of those conclusions is likely to be the most consistent with all the evidence and most accurate with respect to whatever question it is that we're examining. The evidence from the most ancient structures that we know about on earth fits in very well with the biblical narrative but it runs into real significant difficulties when we try to use the secular explanation. This sounds like a great time to go to God in prayer. Today, let's listen to a prayer for our nation. A prayer for the nation. Almighty and sovereign Father, you are the one true and perfect ruler of all that is and all that ever will be. The stars move at your command, and the cosmos stretches out by the works of your hands. If the heavens themselves and all they contain are ruled by you, then how much more are the nations of men subject to your eternal reign? Lord, we come to you today to pray for our nation, the United States of America. In our Pledge of Allegiance, we pledge that this is one nation under God. May it truly be so. May our people recognize that we owe our existence to you and that you are the rightful master of this nation and indeed all creation. Nations rise and fall at your command for you ordain and govern all the affairs of this world. We pray, Lord, that this nation might find favor in your sight as we turn and look to you. We know that there is much about our nation and people today that does not please you and does not conform to your will. Forgive us for this, mighty Lord. In too many ways we have wandered from the truths upon which we were founded. We repent of our wanderings and especially the part we have played in them. We have too often lost sight that we will all be held accountable to you and this has led to foolish pride and unwise presumption. Bring us to a renewed sense of your holiness and justice and help us to rebuke our failings. Help us to humble ourselves so that we may begin again to walk straight paths as we depend on you. Lord, there are many other nations and groups in this world that would seek our harm and even our devastation. Even now, many conspire against us. We pray that you would not allow them to succeed. Do not let our stumbles become an occasion for their joy. We pray that you would confound them in their efforts to cause us harm and injury. We do not ask this on the basis of our goodness, but on the basis of your mercy. Do not let them become proud by granting them a victory as we struggle for restoration. Lord, Give wisdom and instruction to our leaders at all levels, both civilian and military. Turn their hearts to you and bring them into direct contact with your transforming character. Remind them that they are your stewards and that all their authority comes only from you. Let the name of your Son be lifted up in our hearts as we rejoice in the restoration and salvation he brought. We glory and hope in his name. And it is in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Is the Bible important in your life? Supporting Anchored by Truth with a contribution is an easy way to put your faith into action. The opportunity to help is available at crystalseabooks.com. How wonderful would it be for Jesus to commend us because we made his word a priority in our lives and giving. We are grateful for your support and partnership. We hope you'll be with us next time, and we hope you'll take some time to encourage friends to tune in also or to listen to the podcast version of this show. If you'd like to hear more, try out crystalseabooks.com where We're not perfect, but our boss is. 
And for those of you who need that website one more time, that's crystalcbooks.com. Crystal, C-R-Y-S-T-A-L-C-S-E-A, and books, B-O-O-K-S.com. Thank you for your support.